Welcome to this session. Uh, uh, I think the first speaker is Nora. Uh, I think the rules are, so it's half an hour per speaker, so 15 minutes presentation, about five minutes discussant, and then 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, and yeah, so uh, I think, do you need me to give you any red or yellow cards at uh, 10 minutes? Uh, probably at 10 minutes I'll give you a warning or something. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. Uh, Nora. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I will be presenting a policy paper. It will be uh, a slight difference from the mostly empirical papers which we uh, listened to today. So I will talk about education and health services in sub-Saharan Africa. But let me start with a little bit of motivation. And I, will, I would like to present two uh, case studies to you. First of all, Rose's story. Rose is a Kenyan teacher um, I met in Dar es Salaam. She, was, she came to Tanzania on a two-year contract to teach English and science to, at a prestigious secondary school in the capital city. And both Rose and the school were happy because um, her skills were relatively uh, scarce in Tanzania. Um, despite a big number of local teachers, uh, they, were, they did not have market relevant skills. So teachers with good English language skills and strong mathematics skills were in high demand. And uh, the school managed to increase its reputation having uh, Rose and other Kenyan and Ugandan teachers um, um, at their school. However, after, before her contract ended, the Tanzanian government changed the policy, imposing quotas on foreign uh, education uh, services providers, and many teachers left or were sent back home. Rose decided to stay, to wait a little bit to see perhaps uh, uh, her situation can be legalized again, but obviously um, the security of her job was uh, in question. She couldn't uh, have health benefits, she couldn't participate in any pension schemes. But she decided to stay for a while. And I would like to give you another example from health services. It is an Indian company, Me Health Cure uh, Limited, uh, a, com a health company that managed to open several diagnostics centers in Nigeria after overcoming a number of regulatory obstacles. However, because of the lack of uh, skills of um, medical skills in the country coupled with very restrictive licensing requirements and recognition of foreign qualifications, the company was unable to offer the same services it offered in India. So the management came up with a very innovative solution. It transported the patients from Nigeria to India and offered those treatments and uh, procedures which it could not provide in uh, Nigeria. So why I selected these two stories from the a big number of case studies which we in encountered while preparing this uh, study? Because this really showed the problem we have in the country. They show that these barriers on trading services um, significantly hamper, be it the movement of providers across borders to provide a service, or the establishment of various educational or health institutions. But the good, good news really is that these creative providers find a way to circumvent those barriers, and they manage to respond to the sub significant demand, despite the regulatory and explicit trade barriers that hamper their flows. Unfortunately, a big part of their gains is lost either on bribes or um, they add to costs, for example, in the uh, case of healthcare services where they had to uh, transport pa patients to obtain the necessary uh, skills. So the good news is that these flows are happening, but they are much 
lower and probably much slower than in a barrier-free environment. And it is exactly that, that we want to uh, analyze. What are those key barriers? What can we do to remove them? And um, how can we facilitate these trade flows in uh, education and health services in sub-Saharan Africa? So here are the four key points which I would like to cover in my presentation. The first one relates to the magnitude and the direction of these trade flows. Very often we, we hear that there are no trade flows in education and health services or people are surprised to hear that such sophisticated services are being traded or are being exported by African countries. And indeed, if you look at official statistics, this is what you will find. However, we tried to use more innovative techniques such as crowdsourcing and also targeted traditional surveys to get, to get a better picture about the situation on the ground. And this is why my first point is about the very strong regional dimension of, that, of those flows. Not only do we see flows exports and imports in both education and health services, but most of those flows happen at the regional uh, basis. So that's my first point. My second point is about the determinants of such trade flows. And in general, we have endowments or we have costs or quality um, issues which determine such trade flows. And interestingly, here you will see that it's not really the costs which are the main drivers of those flows. It's more about the quality and very often the non-availability of such services at, in the uh, respective countries. My third point is about the barriers to trade in education and health services. And I will look at explicit trade barriers and also regulatory issues which are relevant to both domestic and foreign suppliers. And we will see that very often we, the, the regulatory barriers are more important than the explicit trade barriers. And finally, I will end with some policy recommendations and um, I will discuss a little bit what could be done at the national and at the regional level. So let me start with the uh, regional dimension. And um, 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 I will just highlight some of the interesting findings. And let me start with uh, the sophisticated way of providing such services, uh, distance learning or telemedicine. It's, uh, it is, again, um, a surprising finding for many people to see that, in fact, telemedicine is um, quite heavily used by most hospitals. If you look at the graph on your left side, you will see that most examined countries, and we looked at nine sub-Saharan African countries, uh, use telemedicine as a regular way of uh, providing uh, health services. And if you look uh, on the uh, right side at the frequency of use of telemedicine, Countries such as Kenya or Tanzania, um, in, in countries such as Kenya and Tanzania, more than 33 or more than 44 percent of hospitals use telemedicine at least twice a week. So it's quite a frequent mode of supplying services. If we look at diff another mode of uh, accessing such services, so in education, students crossing the borders to purchase such services abroad. Again, we will see that these flows are mainly regional. It, um, you have this graph which the top, um, so in each country, uh, the, you, you have the top three sending uh, countries in terms of students. And except for Ghana, where USA is sending 5% um, of uh, students, in all other countries, most students come from neighboring countries. So the regional dimension is extremely strong. We see that happening also for health services. I do not have the regional breakdown here. It's just, uh, I'm just showing the proportion of foreign patients which are treated by hospitals in all our examined countries. And you will see that uh, many hospitals do treat foreign patients, and whenever they do that, again, the majority of patients are from neighboring countries. So again, the regional dimension. 
Now, I have here several examples of um, hospitals or campuses, and let me just uh, uh, focus on those intra-African linkages. For example, Kampala International University partnered with uh, Dreamline College in Kenya, and while the curricula is developed in Uganda, there needs to be an accreditation in Kenya. International Medical Group is a very interesting business model because um, it, it is based in Uganda and it uh, connects various segments of the uh, healthcare sector. It not only provides healthcare services, but it also involves insurance companies. And by doing so, it is able to provide services to locals, but also to many foreign patients, again, many from neighboring countries, because uh, insurance coverage is there to facilitate uh, those treatment options. And um, Netcare is um, uh, um, a, a healthcare firm based in South Africa, which again, in addition to providing healthcare services, is also engaging in um, medical tourism. So if services are not available in the country, it facilitates the transport of patients. So I just highlighted these examples to see uh, the innovative business models which are emer emerging in these countries. And um, a final point about um, the movement of various uh, educational health professionals across the borders to provide services. The question which we have here, whether this movement creates brain drain or brain circulation. And uh, what we find is that the situation differs slightly between health and education services. So in education services, the movement of both teachers and educators Tend to, be, um, to, tend to happen in the region. And I have here some examples based on anecdotal evidence. But when it comes to healthcare services, we all know that most, uh, we have a serious problem on the continent. Most doctors and nurses are actually emigrating to OECD countries. And I have some striking numbers here. Um, look at the numbers from Liberia or Ghana. 43% of Liberia's or 30% of Ghana's um, healthcare professionals were in Canada and the US um, in 2010. So this, these are very serious numbers and we can say that it's brain drain that we're talking about in health services. Now let me move on to the determinants of trade. I already alluded to the fact that quality seems to be uh, more important or the non-availability um, of services. And here I have the example for um, health services where uh, we asked uh, patients the reason for seeking treatment ab abroad. And um, as you can see, uh, the lower cost of treatment is really <laughs> The, um, uh, receive the lowest uh, uh, number of answers. So non-availability and higher quality abroad are determining factors. Um, we also see that geographical proximity matters or shared colonial relationship and uh, similar languages are important determinants for such trade flows. And we have some examples from Southern Africa or, and from Eastern Africa. In Eastern Africa, we observed in the past a very um, um, clear division of uh, um, a study field. So the University of Dar es Sa Salaam tend to focus on legal services, uh, University of Nairobi on economics and engineering, while Makerere on um, medical services. Um, and the, when we talk about determinants of trade, we have also, we have to look at the mobility of the various professionals involved. And uh, again, surprisingly, it's not really the better salaries, but it's very often different job, uh, more job opportunities, and also family reasons, which are the main factors determining such movements. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the barriers um, to trade. Um, our crowdsourcing uh, exercise also produced some results on um, how much um, on the cost of these barriers. And I selected some graphs, from, some examples from education and health services. And uh, in the left hand, on the left-hand side, you see the cost of travel and visa for patients 
seeking treatment in Uganda or Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania. So look at Tanzania. If someone wishes to travel to Tanzania to obtain health services, it has to pay an additional $2,000 for travel and visa arrangement. So this came from the surveys which covered our nine sub-Saharan African countries. And then again on the <coughs> right-hand side, um, we asked patients in these countries um, how much uh, they pay whenever they purchase services abroad. So in Nigeria, the average that uh, Nigerian patients pay to get services abroad is $824. So it just shows how much these people have to pay just to be able to access certain services. And <clears throat> What I have here, um, so, so while presenting you saw that trade in education and health services happens through various modes. It's either just a service crossing the border, for example, electronic supply or distance learning, telemedicine, or we have the movement of consumers abroad to purchase services. We have commercial establishments, or we have also the movement of providers abroad to um, uh, offer services. So what we summarized here are the typical trade restrictions affecting all these four modes of supply. And when we talk about mode one or cross-border delivery, so you remember telemedicine or <clears throat> uh, distance learning, we usually have restrictions on the electronic transmission of uh, educational materials or telediagnosis. We have restrictions on the types of courses or treatments which can be offered or restrictions on payments. Um, when it comes to the movement of students or patients abroad, there are many restrictions on the portability of scholarships or the um, um, applicability of medical insurance schemes. Um, there are many exit visas or <coughs> barriers imposed on the mobility and um, costs related to those. Now, moving on to the commercial presence, so let's say if we want to establish a hospital or an educational institution in a foreign country, we very often find uh, restrictions on um, capital limits or on the legal form of these establishments. There are limitations on the numbers of um, suppliers permitted to enter the country and pro to pro provide services and then discriminatory tax or fiscal measures. And finally, when we talk about the movement of providers abroad to supply services, the uh, quotas, the limits, which I spoke about in Rose's example, um, are very um, um, prominent, and <clears throat> the recognition of uh, degrees obtained abroad is extremely burdensome and costly. And very often we also find nationality or residency requirements. So you have here two slides which the, with the main problems, with the main barriers which hamper trade flows um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So in addition to those, we see regulations, domestic regulations, which um, um, further restrict uh, uh, the uh, trade flows in education and health services. If you look at entry regulations, we already mentioned the um, very difficult recognition of degrees obtained abroad. But there are also a number of um, uh, requirements um, in terms of continuing education or training in the uh, country where services are being provided. And in terms of conduct, we will see price regulation, either minimum prices or maximum prices. Uh, advertising can be prohibited. The limits on insurance policy coverage I already mentioned or restrictions on the type of legal entities. And very often these regulatory, these domestic regulatory restrictions are more important than the explicit trade barriers. And what we have to take uh, from, from these slides it, is that it's not sufficient to liberalize those trade flows, to remove explicit trade barriers. Those reforms need to be complemented with re uh, domestic regulatory reforms, which are listed here. And the problem is that usually these reforms are not being tackled in international negotiations. So there need to be additional effort from the countries to engage in, 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 in this dialogue.
Um, so there are, yes, some examples on the various um, uh, requirements and uh, the cost that they impose, but uh, I want to have to put up the last slide on the policy recommendation with some suggestions on what could be done at the national level or at the regional level. So obviously removing the, um, clarifying the various entry requirements, what qualifications are needed, and eliminating the uh, restrictions on competition. You remember the price regulations or advertising prohibitions are just some examples. Um, <clears throat> could be, all this could be done at the national level. We also spoke about the brain drain observed in mainly in health services, so creating some incentives to, for, for health, mainly health professionals to remain or to return to the country could be additional measures. And at the regional level, we mentioned the removal of trade barriers, and this is something that could be done in regional or multilateral negotiations, but in addition to that, I think countries could go further in terms of regulatory cooperation at the regional level to develop some frameworks to make it easier to recognize degrees obtained abroad and um, also to, to discuss some potential immigration reforms. So in a nutshell, this is, these are the key policy recommendations. As I said, it is a policy paper. It is um, a paper that wants to highlight that Education and health services um, are important, trade is happening, but by reforming, by trying to do reforms in all these sectors, we can um, um, help um, and facilitate all these uh, incipient trade flows on the continent. So I, I will leave you with this and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Nora, for that presentation. Uh, uh, it's, as I said, a quick summary of what the paper does. Uh, I really like this paper because I used to work in my past life as a Ministry of Trade and Commerce official in the Pacific, and one of our biggest challenges was to actually convince policymakers and uh, stakeholders that uh, services could also be traded and that we should look at, uh, that, that you know, trade in goods wasn't the only trade that was something that governments should promote. So the big question this paper asks is, of course, how to promote trade in education and health services. Uh, there's a lot of progress, but there are many problems, right? So there is, as, she, as Nora said, there are a lot of uh, regulatory restrictions that prevent this trade from going further. And this paper provides an excellent overview of trade statistics. Uh, it discusses the trends and emerging patterns in this trade. It surveys customers and practitioners and provides a very good summary of the current regulatory framework for these sectors. Uh, and it's an interesting lens through which to view this, uh, you know, health and education sectors in Africa, because normally we think about how to promote health and education at a micro level, but it's also interesting to look at the sort of macro processes that uh, are important for these sectors. Uh, just a few questions on the paper and, you know, some possible uh, suggestions. Uh, firstly, on data, uh, it, I mean, you know, it was, it would be useful to get more information on what kind of questions were asked, uh, how were the participants selected, uh, whether there are any potential selection effects in the kind of practitioners who chose to respond to the survey and who were included. Uh, in terms of education, uh, you mentioned the importance of ICT and distance learning uh, in the sector. Uh, and I was wondering if public policy should therefore play a big role in subsidizing or providing free access to the internet, uh, you know, perhaps to the private sector like Google or Facebook's projects, or perhaps the World Bank could provide support to governments for providing free internet. Uh, uh, African students, you said, travel to OECD for education in the paper, uh, and it would be nice to have some information on remittances that these uh, students send back to their home countries, both those who go to OECD and those within Africa. Uh, and I imagine, and the paper discusses this, that the students who travel abroad tend to be the ones who are richer, uh, and so it would be nice to look at some potential effects on inequality as a result of this out-migration. In the health sector, 
of course regulation is important it'll be nice to see a more more uh, uh, a deeper discussion of you know how governments or the world bank can support how the world bank can support governments in regulating the sector perhaps there could be greater promotion of iso certification both in the health and education sectors perhaps you know there could be more development of the health insurance market and when you discuss the policy reforms uh, the the list of reforms is good and it's you know specific and it's useful but they will come up against vested interests and so it's also useful to think through how the losers are to be compensated uh, and you know i mean we know that the health and education systems are not in the best shape in african countries but are there any role models that uh, countries that do have excellent health and edu- or education systems that other countries could learn from and you mentioned in the paper that mutual recognition agreements especially for qualifications they have not succeeded in other sectors like accounting architectural or engineering services and perhaps it will be useful to think about the lessons from why they haven't worked uh, while you know thinking about these uh, these agreements for other sectors thank you Okay, so whatever you prefer, if you are the chair. Any questions? Okay, good. So then I can answer. And thank you very much for taking the time to look at this paper carefully and providing these comments, which will be definitely helpful when revising the paper. So let me start with your uh, question on data. Um, as I said, we try to push a little bit the limit and come up with some innovative data collection methods. Crowdsourcing and mystery shopping is one of these. So crowdsourcing was used for education and health services. We covered nine sub-Saharan African countries and we looked at about 2,000 um, teachers and students uh, consuming um, and these services are engaging in the provision of such services and about 2,500 health professionals, doctors and nurses and patients. Um, The the, uh, data sets were established in in different ways. So for education um, services, we had ads at university campuses where students were encouraged to participate in those surveys, while for health uh, professionals, so basically we had lists from health institutions and patients, well, it, it was a random process and quite a difficult one to get access to as many patients who are engaged in such trade flows. The uh, uh, discussion of those uh, questionnaires is being done in detail in a separate paper. So, which is also um, on the website. So um, th- that's why we didn't focus a lot in, in this particular uh, paper. Um, in terms of uh, your questions related to um, the ICT I- issues in education services, given that uh, um, online and distance training uh, is becoming more important, I believe that a big focus needs to be on the internet. I'm not sure whether subsidizing um, internet is uh, the best answer, but uh, I guess reforming the telecom sectors and uh, trying to remove whatever uh, restrictions we have on competition could be a first step in dealing with these issues. The remittances sent by, back by students, I believe those would be important in if students have the possibility to remain in the countries where they are studying, because as students, I'm not sure they will send back a lot home. It's only if they manage to stay in that country and get a job. Um, in, in this situation, probably they could contribute uh, uh, to the country by remitting back home. In terms of health services, um, in addition to the various explicit trade barriers which I mentioned, I think that developing the health insurance market is one of the uh, key regulatory reforms that countries should focus on. I I gave you the example um, of um, the, the company in Uganda which integrated the provision of services with insurance coverage, which was a very successful one. So that could be like a model 
that could be followed and probably regulators could use it to, to facilitate the development of such insurance markets. The, your point about vested interest is very well taken. Very often policy makers know what they need to do. It's a political economy question, so how do we compensate the losers? And I think we would need a separate paper just to deal with these questions. <laughs> and, but I fully agree it's a very relevant one. And your final point about the mutual recognition agreements, countries in East Africa already signed such agreements in accounting, engineering and architectural services. And one reason for the uh, problems with the implementation of those MRAs were education related. So it is difficult to recognize uh, degrees and qualifications which are extremely different. You need to have a minimum common um, standard as a common basis and this boils down to education so that's why education services are extremely important because they will be like the input for all the other professional or business services Well, thanks for sticking around for the late afternoon. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Remy Jadwab at uh, George Washington, and this is it's called The Heterogeneous Effects of Transport Infrastructure Evidence from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, though as a bit of advertising, we're a bit lacking in our evidence of heterogeneity, as, you, as you'll see. Um, so what we're, we're, we're trying to look at in this paper is how intercity road upgrading has affected local economic development um, in, in, uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we're interested in this for a couple reasons. What, one is, is sort of what the implications might be for, for current and future road building efforts. So as, as you know, a lot of money is spent on, on infrastructure and, on, and specifically on roads. Uh, for example, about a fifth of World Bank lending is on transport and most of that is, is roads. Um, and most of the highway network in Sub-Saharan Africa is still unpaved. Um, and in particular, you know, there's this idea of a trans-African highway network. And while you know, we don't, we're not suggesting that that is going to be built as planned precisely, it's sort of a coordinating mechanism. And so one goal of this project ultimately is to sort of think about what, uh, what effect that might have on the city system, right? I mean, you know, and recent transport projects in the region are already being built sort of um, talking about that project, you know, so I think it is starting to become something of a coordinating mechanism. Um, we're also interested in sort of the implications for African urbanization in general. Um, some, you know, it, this is expected to increase um, quite a bit over the past 20, next 20 years, adding hundreds of millions of people to African cities. Um, but which cities are going to grow more than others is still, I think, very much an open question. And we think transport might have, uh, the answer may have something to do with transport. Um, this is just a, a map of that uh, Trans-African Highway proposed system to, to be, think about in the back of your head. Um, so what we're doing in this paper is, uh, so is a, a big, uh, a, a lot of uh, new data collection. So we, we built a, a new uh, panel data set on, on road surface as well as city population um, and, and market access for, for 39 sub-Saharan African countries, almost the whole region, over a 50, uh, an approximately 50 year period. Um, and what we're trying to do is to estimate the average effect of, of market access changes, uh, specifically those induced by changes in road surface, and I'll talk more precisely about what I mean by market access um, further. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a measure summarizing a city's access to all other city, uh, to all of its potential, um, uh, uh, to all other economic actors, so all other cities in this context. Um, and what we find is that a doubling of market access seems to induce uh, um, a, a, a doubling of market access seems to induce about a five to eighteen percent um, increase in city population, depending on the the um, estimation method we use. Um, and we also are, are trying to look at at uh, heterogeneous effects of that across uh, different contexts, but but that work is still very much in progress. Um, so this is related to a large literature on, on transport infrastructure around the world, um, some uh, less work, but uh, much less work in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Um, I won't go through this in detail given the time, um, but in particular, I think what our contribution is, first of all, we're looking at this quite a lot, I think a larger scale than most other works. So we're looking, as I said, at 39 countries over um, 50 years and with time slices in the middle of that. So it's not just a long difference. We can actually look at the timing of effects um, as well as you know, tests for, for heterogeneous effects. Um, and also, we're not just looking at building highways. We're looking at more marginal changes, like improving a road, uh, graveling a road, or, or paving a road. And we think that you know it's, that this is perhaps a more um, a more more likely to be the way that African road systems will be upgraded, as opposed to say building a U.S. or Chinese-style interstate highway system. Um, so that it, that it, it may be more applicable in that sense for the future. Okay, so on the, on the roads, so the, the, the two big data components are on roads and, and on uh, population. So on the road side, what we did is digitize uh, Michelin roadmaps for um, uh, every, essentially every Michelin roadmap we could find for the region from 1960s to the present. So Michelin is, the, of course, the French tire company, with, um, and they are producing these maps regularly on average about every three years. Um, and they're drawing their information both from government maps, but also from their network of, um, from feedback from their customers and, and networks of tire distributors, right? And so they have an incentive, given that, you know, this information is used by people who will use their tires on these roads, um, they, they have an incentive to, to, you know, have good quality information about which roads will, will be higher quality and therefore do, uh, do less damage to tires, right? Or more damage to tires. Um, so, so, uh, Specifically, we, we can define the surface of each road, um, which is uh, basically paved, improved, or, or unpaved. Um, and uh, there's a small set of highways in our sample. Um, we think this is an improvement over some of the literature that relies on primary versus secondary versus tertiary classifications, which don't say as much about the quality of the road per se. Um, and we're not looking at, at travel within cities. Um, so this is a map of, of our, our, our region, so that the three different colors correspond to three different sets of regional maps. And the graph below that uh, shows that the, the years that each of those regions was mapped. Um, so this, this is the, what roads look like in 1960. The, um, the, the brown roads are paved, the pink are improved, and the remainder are, are dirt. We don't actually have variation over time in the dirt roads. It's really all about the, the improving and paving that we have information over time. Um, and these are the roads in 2010, so you see uh, a lot more paving and a lot more, uh, and uh, a similar amount of, 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 of improved, right? Um, and that is just being shown further in this graph, right, where, so you see this increase of, um, of uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, kilometers of paved roads over, over, the, over the period. Um, many of those roads that are being paved were improved, which is why the, the, um, the improving, improved line is not increasing very much, right? And highways are just a blip at the bottom. There, there's a, a, not, not a significant factor in, this, in the region. On the city side, um, we, we took, uh, we, we constructed a, a database of, of what we think is just about all localities that ever had more than 10,000 inhabitants. Um, and we, we interpolate, uh, or we either uh, interpolate ourselves or take from our sources interpolated populations for each decade, so 1960, 1970, et cetera, to, through 2010. Um, we, you know, we think population is interesting in its own right, and it's also a, a proxy for local economic development in the absence of, of better measures. Um, so we don't have things like land prices. We also don't have, unfortunately, have information on rural populations um, that we'll, we'll be doing work to sort of infer that from, from national data as, as, uh, in, in future work. Um, and these are coming from, from a, mostly from work by, uh, fr by French geographers called, and it, through something called the Africopolis Project, and we put it together for a few countries ourselves. Um, so this is what the cities look like in 1960. Um, and, and then, you, so you see uh, relatively few cities over 10,000 people, um, and, then, and then far, far more in, in 2010. Um, now, to, to do this in part, uh, we're, we're going to do this analysis uh, at the level of approximately 11 by 11 kilometer grid squares. This makes the computation much easier for calculating the shortest route between the, the, the least cost path between each city, be between pairs of cities. Um, we select, within each cell, we select the best road in the sense of having the lowest cost based on the, um, a, some uh, assumptions we make about cost and we then vary in robustness checks. 
Um, and we sum the, city, the population of all cities within the cell. Most cells contained in most one city, um, only about 3% uh, contain more than one city. Um, and so this gives us up to 2,000 cities per year. Um, the sample is much smaller in the early years, as you can tell. So we have a total of about um, uh, uh, 6,000 city decades, essentially. And when we include two lags, that's down uh, below 5,000. Um, now, the idea of, def of, of thinking about market access is, is that we think that roads matter, of course, more that, beyond just the cities that they pass through. Right? So, so if a road is built nearby, even if it doesn't go directly to your city, it's still potentially affecting where you can get to efficiently. Right? So, so one way of thinking about this is, you know, how, if I'm, if I'm um, uh, you know, is how many people, in, in a context of London, how, how many people can I reach within, say, a two-hour journey of Trafalgar Square? Right? Now, if I build a new fast rail or, 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 um, or better road, that number is going to increase. Right? Um, and so what market access does is going to generalize this for concentric rings of travel time. Um, and so it's essentially going to be a weighted sum of all, of all people outside the city where the weights are declining with travel time. So that, uh, thank you, so that uh, far places count less, right? Um, and building or improving roads is going to increase market access by reducing travel time. Um, in particular, building roads to bigger cities is going to improve, uh, increase market access more. Um, so th this is a... a uh, a fairly stylized idea that gets used, in, in, especially in the trade literature. Um, we don't use, uh, we don't think about congestion uh, for, for various reasons. Most importantly, that we don't really have any data on it. Um, so this is what changes in market access look like over our time period. Um, there are some places, primarily in, in, in uh, DRC, that see decreases in, in market access, hol um, holding population constant. So essentially roads that, according to Michelin, uh, degraded in quality over time. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the effect of this change in market access on, on change in population, right? Um, and we're using a, a, um, a, a, a standard um, uh, functional form for this uh, measure of market access. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll look at changes over time. Uh, we'll look at sort of the temporal evolution of that with some lags, right? Now, the problem with trying to do this and, 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 and interpret it as a causal estimate of, of the effect of market access on city population is, is there, there's, there's a lot of potential endogeneity, right? So um, you might expect reverse causality because governments are going to build roads, roads to places where city, they expect cities to grow, or conversely, that they might build roads to, to, to places that they expect are going to struggle, right? It could actually go in, in other direction, right? In either direction. We could overestimate or underestimate. Um, it also could be the case that all cities in a region um, are growing rapidly for a reason that's unrelated to roads, right? So a local resource boom or all sorts of other things, right? Um, furthermore, our, our, mar our market access measure is, is, is an approximation, and it could be quite badly measured, right? So our, our strategy for, for, for dealing with it, we, we have a few different strategies for, for dealing with this. So um, more crudely, uh, we, we can control for any national level shocks by including country year t um, fixed effects. So, so, um, so they're essentially you know, flexible trends by country. Um, we control for, um, for smooth, any spatial shocks that are smoothly varying by, uh, by controlling for uh, year-specific spatial polynomials, so quadra uh, uh, cubic functions in latitude and longitude. Um, and we can also uh, control for lagged population to address uh, mean reversion. Um, beyond that, um, we, uh, use, we limit the variation in market access change that we use to, in our estimation um, with an instrumental variable that, um, first of all, limits uh, market access to just changes in market access to just changes induced <coughs> by building the building of roads as opposed to changes in population, um, and secondly, by limiting to roads that are only that are far away from the city in question, using various d different definitions of what constitutes far. Um, the most commonly we focus on beyond 50 or 100 kilometers or outside the country, and the idea there is that. You know, we think that if a, if a road between Lagos and Ibadan is improved, um, it's going to help uh, Cotonou in, in Benin, but, uh, but it's unlikely to have been built for Cotonou, right? Um, because it was built um, by Nigeria, right? Um, and so this is going to be a valid instrument if these faraway roads are built for, for reasons that are unrelated to the city in question. Um, so th so th this is our OLS results, um, adding lags across the, uh, across the, um, the columns. So we, we see lagged effects up to two decades 
um, after the road building. Um, we don't see anything in the, uh, in, in the, in the third decade out. Um, and the, in the, mag the interpretation of the magnitudes here is that um, in each of those three decades, a doubling of, of market access due to roads, thanks, uh, uh, implies a, uh, about a one to one and a half percent um, increase in urban population per decade for a total of, say, of three to four um, percent across those 30 years, right? Now, in the, when we uh, use our instrument, um, the, so, so this is our, our OLS results here again. Um, when we instrument um, excluding roads built within 50 kilometers, uh, new roads built within 50 kilometers, um, that increases to, to a doubling uh, in, in market access inducing about a 9% increase in population. If we exclude up to 150 kilometers, it goes up to, um, to 18%. Um, if we use the foreign instrument, um, we're, we're back down closer to the OLS results. So what we think is going on here is that there's sort of a compositional effect, that if, if what matters to your market access is roads that are farther away, it means you're in a relatively uh, remote place, right? Um, but we're still investigating exactly what, what is meant by these. Um, we do a host of robustness checks to deal with various things, including um, data quality, um, uh, as well as um, you know, adding various controls, thinking about railroads. Uh, um, if you're interested, I can talk to you more about them afterwards. Um, so to summarize those effects, we, you know, we, this, this OLS uh, estimate suggests that the a doubling of road access induces a, a one to one and a half percent increase in um, city population for a total 30 year effect of about three to four percent. Um, but using our preferred IV estimates, that, that effect is larger, about, you know, uh, about five to 18 percent over 30 years, right? Um, it appears to be, um, you know, concentrated in the first two to three decades um, with no measurable effect in the fourth decade. Um, we haven't yet been able to, th it, we, we're, we like to think more about whether it's coming from rural areas or other cities, that we have a few techniques to think about that, but we haven't addressed it yet. Um, this is a, a somewhat smaller effect than, than the most comparable paper, thank you, in, in the literature, which is Donaldson and Hornbeck, um, but most other uh, related literature suggested that theirs is on the high end as well. Um, furthermore, this is not, you know, a transportation revolution like you would have seen in 19th century U.S., um, it's a context where the migration costs are probably higher, at least for long distances, um, and in a context of overall lower economic growth. Um, so I'll just uh, um, end it there. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and I must say I really enjoyed reading your paper. I want to summarize my uh, comments and questions um, um, in uh, three points. I do not have a slide. My first point is about the, uh, the really creative combination of the data sources. So uh, the digitiz digitization of the Michelin maps and also um, the use of uh, the data uh, on cities, combining the Africa pol police data with population census, I think it's, it, it is a very um, good approach and I think it will add to, to um, the empirical strategy. My second question um, is on the um, empirical strategy and also the definition of the market access. Um, so the first point is I was wondering why are your effects concentrated in the first two decades? And perhaps you could uh, try to tell us a little bit what is going on in the third decade or, or, or what would be the m main um, explanatory factors behind these results. In terms of um, the uh, market access definition, um, as you say, um, at some point it's not just about building roads, but um, I would like to push it a little bit further um, and uh, uh, add to the whole discussion the um, policy elements and also the role of the institutions. You see, very often we see that even after we are building roads, transport costs are not going down. Sometimes they go up if we see cartels and if we do not see policy reforms. So I wonder whether building those roads without the uh, 
policy reforms in place will actually facilitate access. So I was wondering whether you could uh, discuss a little bit uh, um, the other factors which could influence market access to see um, how results could change if, if, if you would factor in these this, uh, additional elements. And my third point relates about um, the policy implications. So assuming that uh, um, you are talking to a policymaker who sits in the transport ministry or um, perhaps in the trade ministry, so what would be the uh, key messages, the key policy implications that uh, you would like them to take away from the paper? Thank you. Would uh, I can take uh, questions or? Are there any other questions? Okay, um, I guess I'll, uh, I'll uh, thank you very much for those uh, comments. Um, I think the, the, the two that I think you were looking for a response on, and I'll please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, one was about um, the role of institutions. Um, and I think, I think that institutions are certainly very important for, for changing transport costs. Um, I don't think that our context is, is a good one for thinking about that well, um, in part because we, it's sort of one of the tensions of working across 39 countries, right? So we, um, I think, you know, first of all, a, a data challenge from learning about the institutions, but then also even within our, um, I think more importantly, within our, um, our, our, our research design is using country year fixed effects to pull out anything that's going on at the country level. So any, so if, so to the extent that national laws are being changed about trucking, um, about uh, trucking regulation, for example, right, that would all be pulled out by the fixed effects. So in that sense, I think our results are, are net of that. Um, I'm, but it's certainly something that that you know is important to be to be studied. So I, I don't want to take away from that. In terms of policy implications, I think um, I'm hesitant to go too far yet. It, be, particularly because of this issue about reallocate that I alluded to too briefly about the differences between reallocation versus grow, overall urban growth, right? If all this is doing, if these roads are simply moving people from one city to another, um, it's not, th that would be a very different story than if, if what this is doing is actually inducing overall urbanization, right? And so I think to the extent that we, we have some strategies for trying to, to deal with that, we're not quite done with them yet, and so I think I'm, I'm hesitant to, um, to, to say much. I mean, I can say sort of conditionally, you know, that if this is really inducing cities to grow, you know, for people sort of to move out of rural areas to these urban areas more, I think that it, 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 it does, I, I think it gives some modest support for, for infrastructure development, right, and, and sort of um, highlighting the role of, of, of access, right? Um, but, but I think that it's important that we, we clarify where, where people are coming from. Please. When you explain uh, the exogenous source of variation, so could you maybe just explain a, a bit more precisely why uh, the variation in road construction would be exogenous as you um, instrument for it? Sure. So, so the the I mean, so it's a you know, it's it, I mean, it's not um, uh, you know, so it, the, the assumption that under which it would be a valid instrument is that uh, that you know, as we believe, is that. Uh, if roads far away from a city are, 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 are not built you know, for the purposes of that city, right? So the idea is that your market access is, has to do with how quickly you can get to everywhere, right? Um, and, that, and how you get to everywhere involves both city roads near you, but also roads further away. And so we, we, we can calculate change in market access over a decade um, both using all actual road changes, all new roads that were built, and then account, but then the instrument is a counterfactual change in roads that holds nearby roads constant at the beginning of the decade, and allows only roads that are further away to change. Right. So the so, so that that would be valid if if, if those roads far away were um, were uh, built for reasons other than the city in question. Does, does that help? Or? Just wondering whether for each of these countries in sub-Saharan you can figure out the sort of exogenous rules of uh, where the roads should be built. I know some of these countries have uh, 
have sort of um, established uh, rules regarding of where new infrastructure should be and uh, what sort of characteristics. Uh, just back in my mind, I thought maybe that could be another uh, source of uh, exogenous uh, variation that you may try. Can I just ask to clarify, do you, are you asking if, if, if our research could be interpreted to sort of define optimal road locations? Is that what you're asking? Or no, I'm, I'm, I may, I'm not sure I'm getting your question. No. OK, so I'm trying to, to, to think in the back of my mind whether for each of the countries that you have in Africa, you can figure out the uh, laid out rule of what, where the road should be, what, what sort of characteristic population, whether it's market, whether it's uh, uh, mining. Uh, it's, I know some of these countries that, I, that I'm, 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 I'm aware of, like maybe Tanzania or Kenya, they usually have laid out rules, sometimes followed, sometimes not followed. Uh, but if followed, if at the allocation of roads is actually followed according to the rule, I thought that rule could be used as a sort of an exogenous variation. So you're saying it, 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 using a different form of identification based on rules about exactly. where we're Exactly, rules laid out by the government. Yeah, so we, we've thought about that a little bit. We're, we're not sure it would, I think in part because some of those, the best, one of the best rules we can think of is sort of between cities. And so to the extent that what we're thinking about is those cities, we're concerned, we're, we're not sure there's enough variation left. I think, you know, you mentioned mines, so I think, you know, there's been work that looks at railroads that is that focuses on mines, and I think that there, there's somewhat more scope there. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it would work in our case, but I'd be interested to, to, to talk to you more about it. Uh, this is a work in progress with uh, Davide Del Prete and Giorgio Giovannetti. And so this is pretty much in progress, so any comments, it's more than welcome. Uh, let me give you a brief outline. Um, I will introduce the topic, discuss a, bit, a little bit the data that we use, then give you the, the actual evidence that we find about global value chains at the macro and at the micro level, and then conclude. So, introduction. Um, as you know, global value chains are becoming a really hot topic, uh, it's, and it's a very interesting phenomenon if you study trade. And um, you probably know that China integrated, integrated into global value chains by first specializing in low value added activities. And there is evidence, most recent evidence, that shows that China has been changing its production uh, structure and it's slowly up upgrading. Now, one observation could be that as China moves up the value chain, North Africa can become the next hub of some, some labor intensive production, not only, but could be. Uh, there is clearly that there are also opportunities and risks in this, thing, in this kind of um, dynamic. One of the risks is remaining confined to low value added activities of the, of the global value chains. Um, this may happen if no activities are uh, generating more value uh, lo locally. Um, nonetheless, there are also many potential gains from global value chains. And one is possi possibly industrialization and job creation. A and this is mostly important for North African countries given the, the positioning both geographical and logistical of, um, well, let me give you an example. For instance, Moroccan garment industry uh, is in a well, um, it's well positioned. And as an example, you can take the fib citoyen agreement. Um, oh, clearly, although this region has a potential for development, there is evidence that we show you in a moment that um, participation is in global value chains is scant. And 
uh, also not only participation is scant, but also the studies about global value chains are, are quite uh, scant. Uh, and this is mainly due to uh, data constraints. And this particularly applies to the link between macro and micro data. So what is our contribution? Uh, first, we want to assess what is the role of North Africa in global value chains. Then we ask the reverse question. Are global value chains important for North Africa? And finally, uh, we, our question is, are there and what are the possible benefits from global value chains for North African countries? So our contribution is to provide both at the same time, macro and micro evidence. And, and, and this is a first attempt to do th this kind of connection. Uh, at the moment, I believe we are, we are working on that at the moment, uh, but studies linking macro and micro aspects of global value chains are really, are really scant. Um, the macro evidence that we get comes from input output tables. Uh, this is a, also a first attempt to analyze global value chains in North Africa because basically there is no data for these countries. Uh, the micro evidence instead is at the front level and again there is not a lot of evidence on, at the front level because measuring global value chains is, is, is something very difficult. Uh, as an important note we focus on the pre-crisis pre-Arab Spring period which is clearly a, a very important shock so we are analyzing the period before that. Let me talk a little bit about the data. So we have two main data sources. One is from the EORA UNCTAD Global Value Chain Database. Uh, the EORA database is um, a, a big input-output tables, uh, multi-regional, that takes the original data from Comtrade, Eurostat, IDGETRO, and OECD. And the advantage of this data is that it covers 187 countries and 25 indices from 1970. So it's, it's, very, it's, it's very big. Uh, second, for the micro level analysis, we use the World Bank Enterprise Service. Uh, now, uh, let me make a comment to Adam. Uh, you had the version of the paper in which we focus on the cross-section. Uh, as I told you, this is a work in progress. Um, we, we are aware that having a cross-section is, uh, is a bit of a limit, so we are trying to explore uh, some results with uh, panel data. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the EORA. EORA provides a detailed, detailed multi-regional input output table. In case we have some questions, I can give you some details. Uh, there are other similar projects, like WIOD or GTAP or XIOPO, uh, the, the advantage is that this evidence that we have are, is, is new. This input output table is rather unexplored at the moment. And it was first released in mid 2012. Um, the difference that between this project and others is that we have a lot more detail, and the principle that they adopted in building this data set is to avoid transformation of the original data as much as possible. Uh, and importantly, having so many countries, the rest, rest of the world is really something residual, which is important when you work with input output tables. Uh, about the full level data, uh, the World Bank Enterprise Service uh, cover about mm, 130,000 companies in 135 uh, economies. The services are representative of the private sector. They cover both manufacturing and services. In this work, I focus on manufacturing for the firm level part. And they include only in registered companies with five or more employees. And they exclude government state ownership uh, firms. And importantly, uh, data after 2005, 2006 has become more uh, comparable. And that's why we are trying to focus on the panel now. So let's start with a bit of evidence for, uh, from uh, the input output tables. Uh, here we apply a methodology. There are, now this is a growing literature about 
global value chain indicators from input output tables. Here we apply possibly the, one of the most standard methodologies that um, has come up in the last years and, and is the one developed by Koopman and co authors in 2011. And there is also a recent paper by Foster and McGregor that does a similar job. Uh, this methodology, I will skip the details, uh, allows, allows you to compute from the entire table uh, domestic value added and foreign value added. So you decompose export into these two components. Foreign value added measures the value added is contained in export but is generated abroad. Similarly, you can also compute the other aspect of export that is indirect value added, which is uh, domestic value added, so value added produced domestically that is then included in export of third countries. So one of the most basic indicators of global value chain participation from input output tables comes from the summation of foreign value added and indirect value added. And these are the results that we get when we compute this, uh, this indicator of global value chain participation. So uh, um, let, let's focus on, on the uh, top left graph. So here, as you, as you can see, the, the yellow dots are export, total export. So the first thing that we have to notice is that in terms of export, of gross export, North Africa is really a marginal player. <coughs> Um, so this is in terms of value. However, when we consider the uh, global, value, global value chain component of export, so global value chain as a share of total export, we get a really high number, and it is more than uh, 60%. So this is the first evidence that we have um, in terms of value. North African countries are really uh, a marginal players at the world level. Nonetheless, global value chains are really important for their export. Uh, clearly, North African, North, North African countries are not, are not all the same, so here you had some evidence of heterogeneity between countries. Clearly, the different level of participation in these graphs uh, hide the fact that a country can participate in global value chains by uh, being more upstream or downstream, depending probably on their specialization. And I will provide some details on that. On the bottom graphs, you see the evidence of the growth over time in the participation of global value chain, and you see clearly that the, the data tell us that participation is, has been increasing basically everywhere. Uh, here, you have the detail in value of foreign and indirect value added. So as you can see, again, in value, North Africa is really a marginal player. It's a, bit, a little bit uh, higher their share of the, the, the value of indirect value added. This means, and this, this means that North Africa overall is uh, participating in global value chains by concentrating relatively more in uh, upstream activities. Now, clearly, again, you find heterogeneity between countries, with, for instance, Morocco and Tunisia being more, uh, more downstream, and countries like Libya being more upstream, which is due to uh, being resource-rich. Uh, this picture becomes even sharper when you compute this as a share of export. You clearly see that here the foreign value added share is very low for North Africa, while North Africa is the country with the highest value in terms of indirect value added. And again, we find the pattern in between countries. So the, the, this data, uh, this evidence is to our knowledge, uh, one of the first using the EODA uh, input output table. So we need to compare with available data sets. Uh, to give you an idea, we computed also foreign value added uh, from WILD, and we also employed TIVA 
uh, the correlation between our measures and measures computed with this, this other available data set is, is 88% and 76%. So we are almost there. Um, also, in the paper, we provide some evidence of the sectoral decomposition. For instance, Morocco has a high global value chain participation in machinery, but because, and this is because it has a high indirect value added, and also high global value chain participation in textile, but in this case, it has a low indirect value added. So in one case, it's more upstream, in the other, it's more downstream. And this kind of evidence is perfectly in line with more rough measures of global value chain that come from bilateral trade once you decompose between final and intermediate goods. For instance, in this graph, you have Morocco, and you have textile and aerospace, which are two sectors in, in which anecdotal evidence tells us that there are important value chains. Um, in this case, we have a lot of import of textile intermediate goods, while in the case of aerospace, the, the graphs between export and imports are more similar, but um, it, Morocco is more specialized in exporting intermediate goods. Okay, so, and this is mm, what we got for the macro evidence part. Uh, clearly, when you see this, mm, clearly when, when you see these mm, aggregate pictures, mm, the typical answer is what's behind that. And to answer this, we try to recover some questions from the micro evidence. Um, so the question is, is there a link between global value chain participation and productivity? We estimate by OLS uh, the, an equation in which we have firm productivity on the left-hand side and some controls and, importantly, a global value chain dummy. So we are interested in the, in the uh, link between global value chain participation and productivity. Uh, perfect. The important question is how do you measure global value chain participation? Uh, here, in, in the data, in my, any micro data, this is a really difficult task. Uh, in our case, we uh, employ some, some findings from the literature that talk about certifications as a, sig as a signal of the ability of the producer to meet international standards. And for instance, it is found that certified traders are more likely to operate in uh, global value chains. Uh, this is because having a certification, in, in particular when there are incomplete contracts, can, be, um, can facilitate complex buyer-supplier relations and can act as a commitment device. Uh, our data are pretty much in line with this idea. Let me focus on, on these numbers. You see that if a firm is certified, is mostly a trader. On the other hand, not all traders are certified. So uh, our reasoning is that if you are certified, you, you do that because you want to trade. But also, if you look at the data, we know that traders for these countries are mostly, certified traders are mostly importers of something, or either pure importers or two-way traders. And to our interpretation, this comes pretty much towards uh, the idea that certifications are done in order to improve global, global value chain participation. So, uh, let's assume this is a good proxy. What we do is first a basic regression, pooled or less, and we, we find the expected sign for all the trade variables, including global value chains. Then we add some controls, and what we find is that the important sign is for the positive effect comes from importers and uh, global value chain participation. That is certified two-way traders. Now, this is a pool of less. We, pre we have pretty much the same uh, results with a cross-section. Here, in a, we are trying with panel data, so I introduced some lags, and the result is still there. So, uh, to conclude, North Africa has not been able to integrate, integrate into global value chains, but global value chains are important for North Africa, 
uh, firms in global chains tend to be more productive with a premium respect to pure traders. And clearly, uh, if you take, uh, if you uh, buy our proxy, we need some international regulatory co cooperation for the uh, uniformation of certifications. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this paper, um, and I, you know, I think first of all, it's just it's a very important area of research. Um, I mean, trade intermediates is really large and, and and growing, and and something that I think you know lots of traditional data sources have not been able to take care of well. And so I think that you've, you, um, this is, you know, a really important area you're working on. Um, I, I learned a lot about global value chains and, and about North Africa that I didn't know. And, and I actually, I really enjoyed the case studies actually about, um, about um, um, aeronautics and, and textiles. I thought they were, they were quite interesting. Um, I, I, I'm going to focus on uh, just sort of three areas that I think are worth, um, that I'm, I'm a bit more concerned about. And then I have a bunch of little stuff in the slides that you're welcome to look at afterwards. Um, when you um, need to fall asleep or something. Um, but so one is, is, I think about the motivation, I think you may have had a little more in the slides than in the paper, but it, it wasn't quite, so I, I think low entry into global value chains was, was raised as, a, as sort of a bad thing, right? That, that sort of we should want North Africa to be more in global value change as defined here. And it, it wasn't quite clear to me why that was or what the relevant counterfactual was. In particular with this sort of the, this DVX measure, right? If, it's not clear to me why it would matter if, if the intermediates that were exported were then re-exported by the importing country as opposed to being consumed there. And that seems to be an important part of the, the measure you have, the, the, the way you constructed the measure, unless I, I misunderstood that. So I think figuring out sort of what, I guess I was just left, you know, not knowing this, this literature as well, I was just sort of left looking for some guidance on sort of why this, the, these particular um, uh, things as you define them statistically are, are what we really care about. Um, in the, the micro work, um, I guess my concern was that it seem, you seem to be interpreting these, these regressions causally um, and sort of suggesting that, that you know, these, these global value chains are, 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 driving, um, are driving things. And it, it, it seems really uh, like a challenge to do that. So we, you know, there could easily be reverse causality in terms of um, measures of productivity driving, uh, making it easier to get certified. Um, and there's all sorts of omitted variables like managerial capacity that, that could be driving these as well. So I think, I think we learned something from these regressions, but I think I would just uh, advise a bit more caution in interpreting them. Um, and finally, and I think this is, may have changed from, you know, I think, as you said, this is in progress, and I think that the way you described the policy implications on the slide might have been a bit different, but different. But in, in the paper, I saw that the, the two implications were, one was that it was importance, it was sort of highlighting the importance of certification, um, and that seemed to be sort of assumed. So you were defining uh, being in a global value chain as being certified and then saying that certification was important for entering global value chain. So it didn't, th that may very well be true, but it didn't seem like that was something that your, your um, empirics were, were demonstrating. Um, and then the, the other thing that you, you, you highlighted in, in, the, um, in the policy implications was about how human capital was important. And it, it, it seemed to be, I mean, besides the endogeneity issues, it seems to be insignificant in, most of the, in, in, in many of the regressions. But most may be a bit of an overstatement. But so I would just be, especially in light of, you know, since, since there, there are, you know, the, it's hard to interpret them causally, I would be, um, I think, a little bit more um, cautious in the implications. But, um, overall, as a paper, I enjoyed reading very much, and uh, a bunch more for you to read later. So. Okay, um, uh, very good comments. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm glad you appreciated the case studies because it, uh, we are actually working to improve them, also to find a, a good justification for our proxy of global value chains. The fact is that there is some literature on that, uh, and we are studying uh, 
exactly how the issue of certification is interpreted in the international business studies in which we have many interesting cases and some of them provide evidence of this and we have to include them uh, in the paper and find some good motivation. So uh, it was not in, in the version that you had. Uh, because sure, this is one of the most delicate problems uh, that we have. Uh, the, the other important question, which is a question that applies, I would say, to the entire literature about global value chains, uh, is are global value chains good? And what, what is the counterfactual? Um, I can, I, I can talk from, I, I talk f from my experience as a researcher, and I did some work on Italian firms. And what I found is that firms that are somehow, and here it comes back the issue of um, capturing participation in global value chain, firms that participate in global value chain uh, tend to, perf to perform better. Clearly here you have the typical uh, issue of endogeneity. Uh, this is not solved in the, liter in the literature, I'm not going to solve it now, but you observe that in the data. So uh, our interpretation in, in a, another paper uh, about Italy is that this has to do with uh, an increased scope for specialization, possibly. So uh, uh, this is my short answer, but this is really a relevant, a relevant point. Uh, about the human capital, my answer is that mm, this is pretty much a work in progress, so we are investigating, and as you, as you, as you saw, we have the panel, some panel results, and we, in the last regression, I show you that the results are there when you introduce lagged variables. Actually, uh, we will, since now we have two points in time, I would like to try some diff in diff or propensity score matching in order to see whether firms that become, that get a certification or to some other measure pro, uh, enter a global value chain uh, actually have a premium with respect to similar firms. Uh, we, we, are, we are trying to study these things. Thank you. <laughs> other questions? You say that um, all your results are pre-Arab Spring, right? Sorry? Uh, yes, yeah. pre -Arab. I mean, isn't that a game changer? I mean, how, I mean, won't your results be like ob very different after the Arab Spring, Spring that they have been before it? And second thing is, uh, my understanding is countries like Egypt, for instance, uh, have been in a path towards reducing a lot government subsidies on things like electricity, you know, and this is likely to really affect the manufacturing sector, you know? And so my question is, uh, how much does, do the findings you find here sort of apply to the current context and into the future? Thank you. Um, but well, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is exactly what we would like to understand. Uh, the data set that I presented, the results of the micro part, apply to manufacturing and. Also, the point is that we have a lot of heterogeneity between North African countries. Uh, <coughs> nonetheless, we did some robustness checks and the results are mostly there. Uh, they vary between country sectors, but the, the, the basic story is that if you are a manufacturing firm and somehow you are a two-way trader and you get a certification, you tend to be more productive according to different uh, measures. Now, the answer is, the, the question is, where is the direction of causality and what would this imply in terms of development? Uh, I'm not in the position to answer. 
Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, hopefully this is the most recent version of the presentation. If it's not, I'll tell you why not. Uh, this is joint work with Sam Asher, who is here at Oxford, and Paul Numasat at Dartmouth. Uh, rural effects of urban growth. Uh, the, before I start, the standard qualification here seems to be that uh, this is all work in progress, so would really love your feedback and comments uh, and any criticisms. Uh, I will not be in a position to show all the results that I wanted to show today, and hence I apologize to my discussant who had to work with a very uh, rough draft of this presentation sent very late because we just couldn't get the results that we thought we would have for this, and I'll explain why. So, uh, this paper looks at the rural effects of urban growth in a large developing country. Uh, to kill the suspense right now, it's India. Uh, and we know that rapid urbanization has been a big feature of development in many developing countries in the last two to three decades, Africa, Latin America, Asia, uh, which has led to rise of you know, uh, poor mega cities and, the, uh, and the in urbanization without industrialization. So development economics has looked a lot within these cities to look at various facets of urban poverty in these developing world cities, uh, and it has looked at uh, rural changes that uh, have driven urbanization. So they've looked at shocks to climate, shocks to agricultural productivity uh, in driving this urbanization. Uh, we focus on the opposite channel, so this paper tries to look at how uh, in a country which has globally connected cities and a large internal market, how does urban growth that's uh, not driven by rural growth, how does urban growth itself drives rural changes? In particular, we will look at how does urban growth drive changes in the rural economic structure. And this is relevant for public policy uh, in many ways, uh, uh, largely because of this motivation, which is that most of the uh, global GDP growth is driven by cities. 80% of global wealth is in cities. This table is from a World Bank report. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that 0.5% for China is the right figure, but uh, it's the official figure. And we see that there is, uh, that, that despite the fact that most wealth is generated in cities, the majority of population lives in the rural areas or in villages. And the big challenge for public policy is how can benefits of urban growth be transmitted to the rural areas. And so the specific question we focus on in this presentation and in this paper is how does urban growth affect rural economic structure and can public policy help? Uh, in this presentation I won't focus on the second question but I'll tell you why it becomes important. Uh, now this feeds into this traditional structural transformation literature that has for a long time argued that uh, rural growth or rural surpluses release labor to work in cities and that's what drives urbanization and economic growth. In the recent, in the last two to three years, there have been more papers that have looked at structural transformation, how rural shocks affect migration and urbanization. So how climate change or agricultural productivity or changes in the farming systems have driven urbanization. There are a couple of papers that have looked at more microscopic urban to rural effects uh, such as uh, Kocher from India. Uh, Kocher looked at the effect of urbanization on rural schooling and Fafshan and Shilpi have a paper on this in Nepal where they look at distance to urban areas uh, and how that affects the rural economic structure. There are some uh, countrywide papers, Kali and Menon is the prominent example uh, which looks at again rural effects of urban growth. Uh, where we think we can do better is first Kali and Menon is a purely descriptive paper, we think we can uh, provide more causal evidence and uh, until now most papers have been at the district level in India, we think we can do a lot more by going even deeper by looking at uh, towns uh, and villages within districts. So we can look at intra-district uh, effects. Uh, so what we do in this paper is put together data from various sources. This has perhaps been the biggest and the most time consuming part of the paper is to put this data together. So we have data from the economic census which is a national census of all non-farm firms, uh, rural, urban, formal, informal. Uh, in the economic census the enumerators go to every establishment, every, every building in the, in, the, in the village or in the town and they ask is there a firm located here, if yes, what do you produce and how many people do you employ and a couple of other questions. So we can follow employees where they work. We don't know where they live but we know where they work. Uh, 
and we geocode this data at both town and village level. That's the economic census. We have asset censuses from, so we use the 2012 socioeconomic and caste census, uh, which has data on household structure, education, occupation, assets, source of income, etc. Again, geocoded at town and village level. Uh, and then we have the demographic village and town level censuses. Uh, the challenge has been the fact that most of these data sets are not uh, in the same time period, so we are still waiting on the economic census to come from 2012, which will perhaps give us even more precise estimates of employment to population ratios and things like that. Uh, what we want to do really is estimate how rural, how urban outcomes affect rural outcomes. So the equation of interest is change in the rural outcome over time t minus 1 to t, regressed on change in urban outcome. Uh, and controlling for uh, baseline rural outcomes and state and district fixed effects. Uh, there are many ways of looking at what, what do we mean by you know, uh, neighboring village or what do we mean by urban rural effects. And in this paper, we want to look at uh, changes in villages that are caused by changes in the urban economy in the surrounding areas. Now, what is the relevant surrounding town or neighboring town. There are many ways of defining it. In this paper, we just simply do, uh, we find a village, we calculate distance to the nearest town, and we use that town as the relevant town. Uh, this obviously can be done much better. We can create more measures of market access like Adam has done in his paper, where you look at, uh, where you can weight the, uh, you know, weight towns based on distance to the town. Uh, we can also look at the largest town in the area. So one potential flaw could be that here, you know, if you have a village and it's four kilometers away from town A and five kilometers away from town B, we right now look only at town A, not at town B. Uh, now, in an equation like equation one, which is an OLS equation, there are various problems, right? So there is a reverse causality is obviously a big, big, con big concern because rural shocks also affect urban outcomes. Uh, Second, state government and district level factors are important, which we can control, but uh, it doesn't take away all the concerns. Uh, and the, the movement of labor from villages to towns is selective. So what we do is we try to estimate causal effects. Uh, we construct an instrument that is based on national level demand shocks. Uh, we estimate what urban employment in a given town would have been had all the baseline sectors grown at the same rate uh, as they grew nationally. Uh, we exclude the own town employment by calculating these national changes, and that we do to uh, you know, ensure that the instrument is valid. We also construct another version of the instrument where we take out the uh, pop town employment in all towns of that same state. And we focus on tradable sectors, uh, like manufacturing, for whom demand we assume is not local. Uh, so when retail sector grows in a city, this is largely driven by local economic changes, but when IT or, man steel, or steel sectors grow, these are changes driven by exogenous global or national level factors. And this is uh, an instrument that's commonly used in the trade and urban literature, uh, started off by Bartek in 91, uh, and recently used in several other papers, uh, also known as a Bartek instrument. Uh, and we control for baseline population and employment uh, so that there is, you know, we, get out, we get away from mean reversion and we control for state and district effects. So the regression specification that we run, in the first stage we run, uh, the first stage is obviously the change in urban outcome regressed on the instrument, controlling for uh, baseline and state and district fixed effects. And the second stage regresses the change in rural outcomes on the change in urban outcomes. Uh, the relevant rural outcome that I focus on in this presentation is log change in non-farm employment. Uh, so that, you know, I don't do manufacturing employment. So uh, I, I use change in non-farm employment as a proxy for a change in economic structure or structural diversification. So uh, people moving out of agriculture and moving towards non-farm employment. And the relevant urban instrument I use is the predicted or the instrumented change in manufacturing employment, which I think is more tradable than other sectors. And we cluster uh, all standard errors by the nearest town. 
So uh, let me start with some OLS regressions to show you that uh, town and uh, rural factors variables are indeed correlated. Uh, these are log changes, so we can interpret the magnitudes as uh, elasticities. So uh, if you look at re regression specification four, it tells us that within districts, when a village is located close to a town that has grown faster, it uh, the the it, the, the increase in non-farm employment in that village is larger. Uh, and this is from 1990 to 98, and the same results hold when we look at 98 to 2005 changes. In fact, the magnitudes are stronger when we focus on only those villages that are within, for which their nearest town is within 21 kilometers away. Thanks. So OLS seems to suggest that these results do matter. Uh, now let's see how well our instruments do. I am running out of time, so I will not show you tables, but I'll show you the first stage bin scatters to uh, try to convince you that our first stage works, that, uh, that the change in manufacturing employment as predicted by our instrument is correlated strongly with the change in actual log change in manufacturing employment for both 90. 1998 and 98, 2005. This is the reduced form estimate, uh, which shows that from 1990 to 98, the, um, the, uh, an increase in manufacturing employment in towns has led to larger increases in, uh, in rural non-farm employment in villages close to those towns in which those shocks have happened. Controlling for uh, state and district fixed effects and controlling for the, for the size of the village or, or size of the non-farm non employment sector in the villages at baseline. Uh, and this is where results get interesting because now we get from 98 to 2005, the results become negative, which at face value seems to suggest that uh, there is some crowding out happening during this seven year period, uh, which did not happen in the first seven years, which first eight years. Uh, that uh, higher growth in urban manufacturing sectors corresponds to lower increases in uh, the non-farm employment in neighboring villages. Uh, and this is interesting because, uh, you know, we know that when towns grow, they increase demand in neighboring villages for agricultural production. So it's entirely possible that town growth is, uh, is accompanied by a movement out of villages. So people who are employed in non-farm employment now migrate to the towns and those who are left behind folk, uh, specialize in agriculture to feed this growing demand, urban demand. Uh, as I said, uh, I think, yeah. So that's one hypothesis. Uh, I also feel that the, these uh, average effects disguise a lot of heterogeneity because we're looking only at distances of the near, nearest village to the town, whereas what would matter is uh, what matters is market access. So what matters is not just how far the village is from the town, but also how well connected this village is to the town in terms of whether there's a road, whether there is a bus service, whether the road is paved or not, etc. And so that's the next stage of this project where we also try to unpack these average effects and see whether they are being driven by villages that are more or less connected to the towns that uh, are close to them. Uh, and so, finally, in conclusion, we have shown that the rural economy is highly correlated with the neighboring urban economy. Uh, this effect likely operates through employment in tradable or manufacturing sectors. And these effects remain strong when we control for endogeneity uh, and the uh, state and district fixed effects. Um, what we ha are more ambivalent about is direction of these effects. Uh, we find that for the 1990 to 98 period, these effects were positive. Uh, booming towns led to a boom in non-farm employment in surrounding villages. Uh, in the second period, uh, growing towns led to a de slight decline in non-farm employment in villages. Uh, the next steps are to focus on which industries 
how, how different industries have responded differently to these shocks and looking at how infrastructure is important for these effects. And that is the second part of the research question that I first said about the role of public policy. Should governments spend money on you know, improving the village, local village economy or should they focus on uh, perhaps building more roads? And I hope that this paper will eventually you know, go in a direction that answers that question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Karen, I'm sorry if I am partial in my comments. As you know, I had only yes. the opportunity to have a, a limited view of your work. <laughs> so, um, just uh, just uh, two points. Uh, essentially, it seems to me that in your paper you have two issues, two main issues. Uh, first is this entangling the direction of causality. And the second one is due to data availability and measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the second point maybe, maybe comes more from the, the, what I've read, more than the presentation. Uh, so then you, you will tell me whether it's, it's still there. Yeah. Uh, now, the causality issue is, is renowned. Right there are many techniques to, to try to um, face it, but it's still difficult, very difficult to solve. And they, they try instrumental variables, and I think it, it seems to make sense. Now, instead, the data issue, you didn't talk about that in the presentation, is, is, very, is due to the very same definition in the statistics of urban versus, versus rural areas. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit on the link between rural and urban growth. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not very familiar with the literature, but essentially the, od the others focus on the effect of urban growth on rural growth. And this is, this is very good because the literature are mainly focused on the reverse causality. Um, my question, I think, I, I, I don't know how you afford it in, in the paper, but what are the channels and and in particular, is that mainly demand-driven or supply-driven? For instance, uh, if industrial demand expands in cities, then it can be that labor demand moves also towards rural areas. Now, in this case, I would expect to see an increase in wages. Uh, and perhaps a change in the composition of employment, which you uh, talk about and talked about in the, in the presentation. Instead, if rural growth drives urban growth, for instance, releasing labor, I would probably not expect a big effect on wages. Uh, so essentially, in, in your presentation, you talk about employment. I, would, I, would, I think you, you, could say, you could say something about wages. Uh, about the definition, rural areas are absorbed by cities. Uh, so essentially, when a city grows, at a certain point, a rural area becomes part of the city. And this is a problem for the statistic because you risk mixing urban and rural connection, urban-rural connection with connection between different parts of the city, essentially. So for instance, uh, you may talk about positive effects of city growth on rural areas, while instead you are looking at the effect of growth of a part of the city or on another part of the city. Now, clearly, it depends on the statistics. In, in, the, in what I've read, you have a great solution for that. I think it's, it makes sense. Uh, I'm not familiar with this methodology. It seems to make sense. Uh, I just wonder whether you may risk misclassification due to some geolog geological reasons. Uh, I don't know if this is still uh, a problem. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you. No, uh, thanks very much. And uh, I really appreciate those comments given the uh, really short time that I gave you to review the, the work. Um, on the issue of uh, definition and uh, grids, so we uh, started off, uh, our initial reaction was to use grids, uh, grid cells uh, and classify them as being urban and rural to overcome the 
endogeneity inherent in the definition of a place as a uh, village or an or or a town and we have sort of begun to get away from that because we think that uh, grid cells do not at this moment offer us uh, offer us a nice way of you know looking at these effects uh, and we can end up uh, so so whether a place is urban or rural uh, does not only depend on uh, the density of population but also on a host of other features that uh, is hard to observe or hard to aggregate and you know so we are, we are sticking to the definition of uh, urban and rural or town and village as it is in the census what we do is we drop all places that uh, get absorbed into towns so if uh, if there's a village that started off being a village at the start of the sample and was not a village by the end of the sample that it became a part of the town so we don't include that in the analysis uh, the uh, and and we restrict uh, the village and sizes to uh, the census definition so there are places that are almost quasi towns and still get classified as villages for political economy reasons um, and we overcome this by using the census definition for what they think a village is um, in terms of wage growth yes uh, one of the biggest channels would be wages as well as prices for especially for uh, especially for tradable goods uh, and you know as the market size expands the prices should uh, move in a certain direction um, this unfortunately is hard to do because we don't have a local price and wage data for india what we do have is price and wage data at the district level uh, which disguises a lot of uh, which which is at a really high it's not at the uh, high degree of spatial resolution that we work at in terms of our data uh, so we we haven't got very far with using prices and data wages to tell our story but uh, but yeah thanks very much for the comments yeah thank you any other questions I guess, just, oh, thank you. Uh, I guess for this uh, issue of urban rural definition could you do something just like removing villages directly contiguous to a city as a robustness check or something like that? yeah yeah definitely I mean, uh, uh, within villages that are within a five kilometer distance from the city. I have, we haven't looked at that, but we could do that, yeah. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much.